for uh, Applied AI MN. We're uh, super excited. We've got two, present, two presentations tonight. Uh, we've got Joe Schneider from, Co from Dojo5, who's going to be talking to us about uh, TensorFlow Lite um, and being able to run um, machine learning algorithms and AI sort of at the edge. So it's going to be really cool. Looking forward to Joe's talk. Joe's going to talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have 15 minutes of uh, Q&A. And we'll be taking questions via the, the, the chat line or opening up the screen to people um, if they want to ask the question themselves. And then uh, super thrilled, we have Parker Erickson uh, talking tonight um, about a machine learning algorithm that he did to predict the next pitch uh, in baseball. So pouring over a ton of data and trying to figure out based on a certain pitch uh, what the next pitch would be. And uh, super excited to have Parker here um, presenting tonight. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share was, not sure if people were aware of it, but we have also started um, uh, Conversations on Applied AI podcast. And so um, I've interviewed a couple people, um, just released the second episode uh, today. Uh, the first episode was with Dan McCreary, um, released that last week. And I'll be sure to put a, a link here, um, both in the chat room, but then also we'll go ahead and post it on our website um, as well. And I uh, can also show the new Emerging Technologies North website as well. I'll show all sort of that stuff at the end, I guess, but um, really, really cool. So, so yeah, we had a, we've had some really good, good, good conversations. In fact, uh, these two guys that are on the pod, that are on the uh, um, that are speaking tonight have been on the podcast as well. So, still sort of in the process of producing it, but both Joe and Parker, um, we've had we've had some really good conversations on the podcast, and those will be coming out in a couple of weeks. So, stay tuned for more of that. So without uh, further ado, I think I'm going to see if I can stop sharing here the screen. And Joe, if you want to be able to try and take control that, of the screen here. I will attempt. All right. You guys see me all right? Yeah, looks great. All right. Good. All right. Yeah. So thanks, Justin, for having me. And thank you all for having me and, and uh, showing interest in this. This is a really cool topic for me. So I'm excited to to chat a little bit about TensorFlow Lite for micros. Um, yeah, and I've got, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm measuring time here in days after COVID. I think we're all gonna be thinking that way. Um, in show about myself, um, as I mentioned, <laughs> if you're here a little early before we started, I got three awesome girls um, and an awesome wife. I was at uh, formerly at John Deere and now leading Dojo 5. We're focused on firmware. Um, and doing lots of things firmware AI being a really interesting piece that's kind of just coming down to the edge now. So uh, that we're just starting to use in a couple of projects. And passionate about building great cultures, high performing teams. That's that's what I enjoy doing. It's super fun. Um, yeah. That's, that's who we are. <laughs> All right. So I wasn't sure what the audience was totally going to be here. And if, if we're who people if people would even understand what i mean when i say embedded um some people say like you know you mean like journalism or something so um in my in this case you know embedded is really a computer computing device with a dedicated function um generally bare metal or running some kind of rtos which is you know poor man's version of windows kind of um it basically allows it to do multi multiple multi-threading um usually less than 100 megahertz, often less than a mega flash for your program, and less than 500k of RAM for uh, any data. So we're talking pretty darn small here, especially when we start talking about AI, because a lot of those, just models can be, you know, megs. <laughs> and so this is uh, an interesting uh, space to be applying that. Um, and just kind of to give an idea, too, of the um, power that these things typically use, um, AC unit in your in your house could be 1,000 to 2,000 watts. A laptop charger, maybe 80 to 100 watts. Raspberry Pi is usually about five watts, depending on what model you got. Roku, three and a half. Smartwatch, you're down in the milliwatts category. And these guys, especially the temp TensorFlow Lite for micro guys, are really targeting that milliwatt category. So can we have you know sensors that are always on that are um, on battery and last for years and doing AI. And that's kind of the wild uh, uh, place that we're trying to, trying to get to here. Um, <laughs> I, I believe that uh, embedded development's tragically behind. And so this is where, you know, the mobile and web guys have all these cool unit testing tools, amazing debuggers, one-click DevOps, real-time monitoring. 
and they have AI. And I just keep on adding bullet points to this list because I'm not saying I'm jealous, but I'm kind of jealous. And so I'm really excited that the, uh, the AI, uh, the TensorFlow folks have uh, focused and, and gotten us uh, a lot more AI stuff at the edge because this is, it's uh, gonna be great. So yes, enter TensorFlow Lite for micros. Um, <clears throat> just high level, um, born out of Google and really their wake word detection. Um, you know, they, I think, as they uh, determined that they wanted to get, um, uh, be able to do this wake word stuff, they realized, hey, the phone's gonna need to be off uh, in order for people not to have a terrible battery life. This thing can't be running all the time, but we need this always available wake word detection. And so um, that was really the internal impetus for TensorFlow Lite. It wasn't announced publicly for a number of years um, and, and only recently open sourced last year. Um, Pete Warden's a guy, and I'll, I'll have a link to a book at the end here. I think we can share the slides, Justin. Um, but he, uh, he and another guy wrote a book, and then Raziel is a guy internal at, at uh, Google who also helped kind of pull together TensorFlow Lite. Um, as I mentioned, targeted at less than one milliwatt devices, which is pretty darn uh, sipping, sipping those little tiny batteries. There it's it's uh, not a lot of energy uh, to uh, try to get these uh, uh, algorithms run. Uh, and it does have a limited API compared to TensorFlow, and that's just out of necessity to help uh, these uh, models fit in the, in, uh, the micros. <clears throat> and I should have mentioned too, just, yeah, if you have any questions while I'm going on, I'm fine to just kind of stop at a slide rather than ha having to hold until the end. So I'd rather just take it as we go and, and have a little discussion and then move on if we want to. So feel free to just chat um, and then, uh, um, if uh, if you've got a, a question, we'll just take it as as we go. So yeah, I think um, uh, from the deep learning workflow uh, for TensorFlow Lite, it's largely the same as large device deep learning. You're still kind of following these steps. Um, you're deciding on a goal, collecting some kind of data set, designing a model, training the model, and then I'd say the convert the model piece is really the piece where a lot of the TensorFlow Lite and the micro it's that's where you add a little tweak. Um, to get it right, and then run inference and, and evaluate troubleshoot just like uh, any other model. So largely, it's, kind of, it's, it's pretty much the same uh, that we've, we've seen in other places. All right, so I'm going to be demoing a couple of different um, uh, AI things. I, I like to get my hands dirty and get onto things. Uh, this is the hardware that I have. Um, and that I'm going to be demoing stuff on. It's, uh, it's a newer Arduino platform. Um, and it's based on <clears throat> this little U-Blocks uh, module over here, it has a Nordic NRF52840 in it. It is a Cortex-M4 ARM processor with 64 megahertz, a mega flash, and 256K of RAM. So it's, it's uh, you know, eh, medium-sized chip in the embedded world. Um, and then they have lots of cool peripherals attached. There's some gesture sensor, there's a microphone, there's a... Uh, LEDs, there's an accelerometer. So it's kind of a cool um, platform. And the TensorFlow Lite guys actually identified it as a good platform um, and built a number of examples around it as well as um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Arduino guys also um, have ported a lot of stuff to Arduino. We'll get there, yeah. So Arduino support for that, I think is what really kind of brought this uh, to uh, the ability to easily kind of try these things out and start building with uh, um, TensorFlow on these little micros. I think uh, largely the, uh, you know, as it was initially starting, um, it was hard to get all the tools installed correctly, hard to kind of figure out where things were at in TensorFlow and, and, and how you would get to the TensorFlow Lite stuff compiled. It was all very like if you're targeting like Android, then you know how to do it and there's a clear path. But if you're trying to hit a micro, any other micro on any other platform that was pretty tough. And I think Arduino is, uh, is a nice place to kind of land um, in the middle. Um, Arduino, for I guess those who don't know, is, is a um, company that uh, for probably almost a decade now has been producing um, platforms, initially really focused on educational and kind of learning, uh, uh, and now have expanded their offerings to a large number of different devices in a large number of categories, uh, still with, kind of a heart for learning, but they're 
I think that we've seen that Arduinos are getting used a lot in industry for prototyping uh, devices and uh, kind of proving out proof of concept type of things. So it's uh, pretty interesting there. Um, and so yeah, Sandy uh, did a lot of work there to port TensorFlow to Arduino and provided it a nice, easy to add library. That works pretty well. So <clears throat> I'm gonna walk through real quick. There's, there's a, the first demo is just kind of gets our feet wet and kind of shows us um, what, what we could do. And this is, they're, they're claiming that the demo, so you know, in, in programming languages, we've got a hello world demo in, um, in the embedded world and the machine learning demo world, they, wanna, they want to um, create a sine wave demo. They're calling that the hello world. And so the idea is, is can we train uh, a machine learning algorithm to you know, basically predict the sine value, the y value for any given x value? Uh, within a range. Um, and so that's what we're going to walk through. Any questions so far? All right. Pull up. Yeah, I got a quick question, Joe. I mean, you, yeah, mentioned, sure. you, you mentioned Arduino. Um, I mean, would you say that's, that, that's one of the largest open source platforms, I guess, out there was very smart for them to create a library just regards to adoption rather than focusing on a more proprietary thing like NVIDIA or something like that? Yeah, well, I think that it, it just, there's just so many people with hardware out there already. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so many people with that knowledge. And, and I think, I think the, um, you know, like take NVIDIA or something like there's a lot of people that understand CUDA, but there's, you know, and, and they, NVIDIA has some, uh, there are some other projects uh, or they've got some processors now that have hit the market the Jetson and some other ones that are um, uh, 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 focused on that kind of that higher end edge mm -hmm. learning um, mm -hmm. but um, the lower end stuff I don't think you know really what's needed is like this uh, you, you want to write these examples once and you want to be able to um, uh, uh, have those port easily to a number of different platforms that you can keep up with the pace of innovation, I guess, at, at the, and with all of these hardwares and sensors and stuff. And so that's where I feel like Arduino has kind of set the um, API really for how do we interface with at the hardware layer. And so I think it was a smart idea for um, the TensorFlow guys to hit up the Arduino guys and then for the Arduino guys to, you know, see that there's an interest in a, in a, in a focus here. So yeah, I think it's really neat. Cool. All right, so let me pull this up. So like uh, any good TensorFlow demo, um, it, there's a Python notebook involved. Um, I have links to this in these slides. That's what those notebook and readme links are. Um, that's uh, these two, and you guys can see my, uh, my, uh, um, yep, yep, your uh, notebook, your Python. <laughs> yeah, okay, whatever <laughs> word I'm trying to look for here, yeah. <laughs> So, yep. so anyway, yeah, I mean, I mean, the idea, they've got a really nice write up here on how this works. Um, I would, <laughs> there are links that are broken, use, use the links that I sent if you want to, but I think, um, you know, it's, this largely runs the same as uh, something else that you would, uh, you know, run through a Python notebook. Um, the, um, here, we can just clear it out. But yeah, I think, um, uh, you're still you're still doing a lot of things that are the same as um, uh, what you'd typically see in a TensorFlow world. Um, you're setting up your environment. You're um, uh, making sure that we get uh, you know seeding our random numbers, importing our dependencies. Yes, 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 and the. And I, I'm not sure how many people have been through this whole process. I'm guessing the majority of people have at least, you know, some kind of working knowledge of what's going on here. So stop me if you want me to dig into any of this. Um, but at what what's really, uh, you know, and, and, and we can kind of just go through real high level. Obviously, they're they're creating a bunch of x values. They need to be randomly distributed so that we can um, train the model. The model doesn't cheat by figuring out that you know uh, uh, um, values are coming you know, um, in the same order as the sine wave and that they're, you know, going up and then going down. We want it to kind of uh, learn based on the X values. So here we have our, you know, basically our training set. Um, we add noise um, and that just helps us uh, not overfit um, too quickly. And then <clears throat> they split out in training, validation and testing, which is really standard 60, 20, 20. And now we've got, you know, a bunch of data. I'm gonna zip through this, so please, 
tell me to slow down if you need to, <laughs> because I've, a lot of this isn't micro specific, mm -hmm. um, at least on this, on this model. But now we're, we're basically creating a really, really simple um, architecture, a really simple model. Um, we train the network. And of course, this takes a little bit of time. And um, what we see on this one is that it's, um, it's going to underfit. It's not, it's the network isn't quite, uh, and, and you know, and while this is training, it's, it's interesting because this is, I feel like this is an interesting piece uh, that's a little bit unique to the, um, the embedded world where like you really have to think a little bit more. I think that, you know, if start with more like simpler architectures on the micro side than you do on uh, some of the um, more beefier um, compute sections because those, uh, you know, you can, you can get away with a much larger uh, model. You can get away with a lot more um, RAM, but on, on some of these models you can see. So this one, you know, didn't, didn't train that well. It's all right. <laughs> but, um, and then we, um, yeah, so clearly, hey, we're getting the idea, but slowly, you know, slowly training. So interesting Then we can train a better model. Um, and, you know, when we've got the better model, it's going to get a bunch better. So our loss is already going way down. We can see that as, uh, as we've got a better ar architecture together, we can uh, train a better model and predict sine wave. And so what we're, what we're eventually targeting here is so, so here I've got our board. Um, and on this board, we've got an LED. Um, so maybe I'll just flip back to the slides real quick so you can, yeah, it's a little hard to see, but there's an LED that's sitting right over here by the USB connector. And that's uh, on both sides really. And that's the one that we have control of. I guess it's gonna be this one that we're, that we're blinking. But the idea here is that we're actually gonna, um, okay, so we've done that. I'm gonna draw the graph of the loss. <laughs> And now we've trained, yeah, much better. Uh, calculate and print. Yeah, so now we've got a model that's actually, you know, able to fairly well predict a sine wave, which is pretty cool. Um, and now we kind of get into the part where we're actually talking about the TensorFlow Lite converter. So this can, takes the models from Keras and is able to make them a little more space efficient on memory constrained devices. It also um, allows us to quantize uh, that and that's one of the big things I guess is you know a lot of these models and we'll see this a little later too uh, uh, a little more clearly but you know when you're uh, computing with floats um, it not only uh, you know that's that's just the way you do it when you do it on on higher power devices but uh, when you're doing it on lower power micros that can actually in, increase the uh, inference time significantly and so um, quantizing the models to use integers um, you lose some fidelity in the model but if you train it well, um, you're, it's often uh, acceptable, and then you can get to a point where um, the uh, you're you're able to to run your model very quickly, um, even on these low power devices, which is pretty cool. Yep. So here's like I don't know if you how much you guys have gotten into TS Lite, but there's a converter here. You can just kind of import your model, convert it to a TS Lite model, uh, write it out to a file. And uh, you know, there's a number of different optimizations that you can run here where we are quantizing it um, and then writing it back out so that we've got an uh, uh, integer-based uh, model rather than a floating point model. And that'll help us quite a bit. Hey, uh, uh, Joe, there's, there's just kind of a general question about why you maybe wanted to need AI on an embedded device. Um, yeah, sure. Opposed to just sure. uh, you know, shipping the data to a more powerful machine, for example. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And I mean, you could, you can do that, right? You've got these, uh, you've got somewhat ubiquitous internet. Now you can hook up to cellular, you can hook up to LoRa, you can hook up to all kinds of different connectivity options. I think the general idea is that once you, you know, it costs us power and it costs us, um, uh, data to, uh, send things up to the a more powerful cloud. And I think, um, as more and more sensors are getting deployed out into these situations, um, you realize that like that multiplies out pretty far. Like if you, okay, you got one device on one battery or, or, or in, in, you know, if it's going to be on cellular, then it might need to be plugged in if it's going to last for any amount of time. Um, even with MBIOT or CAD M, some of the newer technologies for cellular, the, I mean, those devices maybe can last a month or two, or you, or you start talking about a pretty beefy battery for it to last much longer than that. So, I mean, we're really imagining like, how do I, 
like install like a, a lifetime, uh, um, like no service needed type of sensor inside of a street lamp in a city. Um, and that can sense whether the light's turning on and off and alert us if the light's not working. Um, or, or something like a 10 year, 20 year type of model. How can we get to that point? And I just, I don't, uh, there isn't a technology available a day that lets you to do that um, when you're shipping, you know, information off of the device all the time. I guess the light's a bad example, but if you start to think of more uh, uh, complex, like, like think about even with the riots going on and stuff, we've got, um, you know, uh, gunshots in the street and we've got the gunshot, you know, triangulation stuff that's happening. Um, like a lot of that, um, can we do that for cheaper, less power? Um, could we could we have more ubiquitous sensing uh, and deploy those sensors for uh, you know, a lower cost, where we can very quickly pinpoint, you know, where someone might be in trouble? Um, there's there's a lot of really interesting, I think, um, applications that pop up uh, when you say like, hey, sensors are only going to be five bucks, and we don't have to have a crew, an army of people, you know, going around switching batteries every couple of months, or we don't have to wire it into the power system. Um, and, and that just enables a lot of interesting um, uh, applications. Cool. Yeah, with regards to applications, uh, one of the other people here had talked about um, machinery vibration analysis. Um, I know you and I have talked a little bit about a couple mm -hmm. of companies that have been doing that locally. Um, I don't know if right. you want to name, I don't know, I'm not sure if you want to name drop them or anything like that, but it certainly is an application, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the yeah the predictive. So yeah, Boone Logic was one that um, I know up in town that they're doing predictive analysis, uh, you know, predictive failure analysis, uh, you know, and, and doing some even even some machine learning on the edge um, or like training retraining on the edge, which is even you know beyond what TensorFlow can do at the moment. So it's uh, you know I, I think they're finding value in that where um, it's it's not you know it, like we kind of have this class of device that you know it kind of needs to be sort of chunky in order to, uh, you know, uh, contain a battery and a cellular device. And that's like, that's, that's, kind of, that, that's, become, that's a fairly modern architecture right now. But I just think we're, we're going to see in the next couple of years that that will, um, that will serve a certain class of businesses and a certain set of problems. But I think that there are other problems that are currently, um, that, that that cellular class device isn't able to serve yet. And, and they're not, they're waiting for something like this. And, and then that will, this will unlock a whole new set of, um, of applications, I think, just because the, the business model will suddenly make sense. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I know there's a company, ATEC Access Solutions, that was kind of doing a lot of this monitoring um, as well um, mm -hmm. in town here. And, and again, yeah, it's, you know, how, how can you get the data analysis as close to the edge as possible really um, because you're right, there is a huge cost to bringing it, bringing it back to the mothership, I guess. Um, another question came in about just advantages of doing this in Arduino versus, versus Raspberry Pi, right? So that you're, you're going to show an example here where you're training the model in the cloud. That's what's going to happen right now, right? And you're going to exactly. basically going to, going to create a TensorFlow Lite version and you'll run it on yep. your little microcontroller that's running Arduino. Mm -hmm. Have you guys looked at, um, I guess, you know, Pi's got a lot more capabilities, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Sure you guys had looked at just running TensorFlow, just, I mean, straight out on a plot, just out, just out on a pie, for example. You can, for sure. People are doing it. Um, I think the problem here is, or, or what, what they're recognizing is that a pie is about a five watt device and we're trying to get to milliwatts. This is orders of magnitude lower uh, power usage. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's where like, it's, uh, I, I think the pie, like, like, I don't think these, these class of devices are going to be doing, um, you know, like, like, uh, like mass uh, gathering face detection, or I don't know, like any of these like really large, heavy, like video um, type of um, uh, AI types of situations. Um, I think that the Pi is a much better choice for that type of application. Um, but when you're talking about like, can I, can I listen for the water running in my house? And then if I, if, a, and have a sensor that just sits there like a smoke detector, but it's using the audio to figure out if the if the if the you know faucet's been left on, and then it, it can and it can run for years just sitting there waiting for the faucet to be on. And you know if it hears it running for five minutes, it just shoots out a little you know message over BLE to your phone and says, "Hey, we uh, you know it looks like you left the water on." I I, I you know that's the type of application that I think this is going to open up 
Um, and could we build that into faucets coming up, you know, up or, and, and, and maybe it doesn't connect to your phone, but maybe it connects to your BLE gateway that's built into your Amazon Alexa or your, your Google home. Right. I mean, that's coming and all these little devices are going to be starting to, to kind of interoperate and then, uh, just help you, you know, and then if I'm sitting, you know, watching Netflix and, uh, you know, all of a sudden my Google home just says like, Hey, the water's running upstairs or your seven-year-old looks like she's out of bed, you know, <laughs> or, yeah, sure. or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the type of thing that I think is going to um, really open up with some of this stuff. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. You bet. Thanks for the questions guys. Those are good. Okay. So they've got a cool um, comparison. So you can see that like in this case, the, the original model um, was 2,700 bytes. The new model is 2,500 bytes. So quantization saved us. I don't know, not quite 10%, but, a little bit, you know, and so uh, it can, yeah, it's it's already pretty small, but you know, it's it it definitely helps us. So we can, I mean, all of a sudden, uh, you know, actually the you know for for this size of a model, the micro that I'm running it on, even though it's only 64 megahertz and it's only got a mega flash and you know 300 some k of RAM, it's it's actually overkill for this model. I could go, I could be running this on a um, on a processor that sells for 50 cents you know, and can last for three years on a, on a battery. So that's, that's what all of a sudden is enabled here. You know, I mean, it's not doing a whole lot of any, anything interesting. It's calculating a sine wave, but we'll see that, you know, I think that's, that's kind of the, the power that this is unlocking. <clears throat> so, and then we can see like with that quanti quantized uh, um, model, we're still actually getting um, uh, a pretty good um, fit to our sine wave. So, that's, this is, this is where the power, I mean, this is the money right here. That's, that's, uh, TensorFlow Lite is now with a 2K model, we can predict sign. And then this is basically, um, in XXD is just a tool that converts uh, the TensorFlow Lite um, binary format into a format that we can include in a C file. All right, and then we can just cat it out and there it is. So this is a big array of data um, in uh, a, a format that I can copy and paste into a C file. And then, uh, it, but it represents the, the trained model for uh, sine wave. So let's grab that. And I'm gonna pull that into um, Arduino land. So for those who haven't seen Arduino, oh, I'm full screen, hold on a second. No, nope, I was full screen. Let me figure out my computer here. There we go. All right. Oh my goodness, computer. Where are you putting Arduino? I just saw it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> Arduino doesn't like to go across screens. Yeah, so, so what this program does then is it, it basically walks through X values incrementally and asks the machine learning engine to predict what the Y value should be. And then it lights up the light, uh, the LED with an intensity um, scaled to the number that it's chosen. And so if it's, if it's scaling correctly, um, or, or if the machine learning is, is, is um, working correctly, we will see like a very smooth, like up and down pattern that represents the sine wave. It will get brighter and, and darker and brighter and darker. And if it weren't working correctly, we would see it all over the board, right? So uh, yeah, if you haven't seen Arduino, this is kind of what this environment looks like. Um, I pulled up, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh-oh, this could make the, the demo gods are <laughs> angry with me, apparently. This could make this a little interesting. Luckily, it comes up somewhat fast. <clears throat> so yeah, so so we we try to go up and down, up and down, you know, with a, a fairly you know, um, a very smooth, and and, you, and you'll be able to see that it's fairly smooth here. Okay, can I resize it before we lose? <laughs> okay, so I mean, and you can see there 
we're still pulling in TensorFlow and TensorFlow Lite. These are the same header files that we, you know, use if we're using TensorFlow in other situations. Um, the, when you install Arduino, just for folks who want to play with this, which I hope you do, especially if you haven't done any embedded stuff before, you will get um, TensorFlow Lite stuff here as examples. And these are some pretty cool demos that you can pull up. I'm just going to show you two of them, but um, actually just one of these examples, but you can play with some other ones. They've got one where Magic Wand does gesture detection, micro speech does like, it'll detect whether you said yes or no. I'll say that it's, eh, the training is a little, you know, dodgy on that one. <laughs> like sometimes it thinks you say no and you say yes, but I, you could see that it's kind of, it's, it's honestly amazing what it is doing for, uh, for what it is. So that's pretty cool. Um, oh boy. Let me, I'm going to leave it on the other screen and open it up in a different editor um, so that we can see that, see this a little better. Sorry about that. Uh, seems like it doesn't like it when I'm scrolling. I don't know. <clears throat> Do, do you recall in the code if it's a sequential model? I guess there was a question that came through which, with regards to like what type of model it is. And usually in, in TensorFlow, you sort of define a, the type of model. Oh, let me check. I'm not okay. sure what they put together for this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I think we defined that really. Um, back when we generated the model. Right, right. That is where it would um, be. It would be in that yeah, Python yeah. code somewhere. Be like a TF right, right, dot right. something. Right, right. Um, oh yeah. And which would be right here. Yeah, unfortunately this like URL is pretty wild. I could post that so people could play with it honestly if they wanted to. Um, what is it? TF generate the data model yeah there you go so, thanks mm -hmm. all right oh come on <clears throat> yeah it seems like a little happier when it's on my other monitor so i i don't know maybe i should um maybe i should just have it um Share my other monitor, huh? I could do that too. The monitor it wants to wants me to share here. Let me shut down a few things. All right. I think I can do this. Yeah, the challenge is just going to be, it's going to be much larger. Let me, okay, I'm going to give it one more shot. And if it, because I, I did shut down a couple other other open um, uh, Arduino sketches. So hopefully it isn't going to give me hard time here. I'm going to size this down. Oh my gosh. No, it's totally that's the third monitor. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll see how this comes through on Zoom if I share my entire 4K monitor. <laughs> All right, is that in any way, shape or form readable? I can, I think I can increase the font size here a good. bit. Yep, that works. Yeah, okay, cool. <clears throat> well, I think this is hopefully gonna help us, but yeah, I mean, so you're doing a lot of stuff to set up, but you're still in Arduino land, you still gotta set up, you still gotta loop. Um, you pull in the model here, um, 
and yeah, I mean, you basically, you got your inputs and outputs. Um, and then, you know, what this is doing is it's looping based on the, it's coming up with an Excel based on the position that you're in and it just counts how many inferences you've done and then uh, puts that inside the range and, and then uh, asks, here's us actually running, you know, our inference. And then uh, if it succeeded, uh, then we um, run the, uh, where is it? The Arduino output handler, which handles our output. And here we um, set the brightness. And this is, this is an Arduino world, but um, this is how you would tell an LED to turn on a, uh, to a certain brightness. So here it's gotten the Y value um, from, the, uh, from the model and it's uh, setting the brightness based on that. So yeah, um, they have some uh, um, signed model data that they plugged in. Our model is probably very similar to that, although yeah, it's, it's different. I'm not sure exactly which part of it's different from what they initially plugged in, but we can basically take our model, and I'm just grabbing that now from, from the uh, Python notebook that I grabbed, and we just kind of toss it down here. Sign model data. Paste it in, and we have to, yeah, I just called it a different name. And, oh my goodness, hold on one second. I'll just toss that. All right. So I'm just saving this to a different location so I can save it and then compile it. Um, maybe a step that some folks haven't done if they're not on a micro um, or if they're, obviously if you're using TensorFlow C then you are. Oh yeah, of course. So what did I get wrong? Oh. You missed in a square bracket at the end or? Mm, unsigned no. char. Yeah. Unsigned char, G sign model data, G sign model, oops. Const, unsigned char, const. I bet it's because we're const. Unsigned char, G sign model data, G sign model data, yeah. <clears throat> and there are definitely, oh, it still is angry at me. Oh, this one's counts too. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the, I would say that, it's, you know, definitely you can see that these guys have, um, um, Constant. And signed ant. Oh. Oh man. Okay. Constant sign char. Constant sign char. There we go. So you can see like the, I think the demos I've found in my experience, if anyone tries to go through these demos, they're, um, they are a little rough around the edges. Um, <laughs> there are things changing. I think it's a pretty new library and um, they, they found some people who are, you know, were interested in it, you know, six months ago. And uh, it's kind of like, I, I think they're kind of like moving on to other things, but I don't know. I, I, it's a, uh, like, as far as the demos concerned, this is a great place, I think, to start and kind of play around with it. It's really, really close. All right. So now I got to just pick my board. Here's my Arduino Nano BLE board. And now I can uh, program it. All right. And now if you watch my video, with any luck. There it found it. We're going to upload the code now to the device. And there we go. So you can see how the um, 
that orange LED is kind of pulsing. And yeah, sorry, my virtual background is. But yeah, that's basically, so that's machine learning, calculating the value of a sine wave on a micro, on a 64 megahertz micro, and then uh, basically changing the brightness of the LED based on its, uh, its uh, result, which is pretty cool. So, okay, that's a toy project. What could we actually do that could be cool and interesting? Um, let's go back to the slides where did those end up? Since I've had like, there we go. Yeah, apologies for clicking around here because I was, had everything laid out for that, for the one monitor. Um, yeah, there's not actually too much slide here, but um, the, um, and, and yeah, like I mentioned, definitely check out these slides. Um, the notebook that I used, and the, there's a README too that kind of walks you through a little bit of how that works if you want to just get up and running. Um, I did have the link too for the um, for the hardware back here if you want to buy it. It's about 35 bucks from DigiKey. You can get it shipped in a day and kind of fun to play around with. Um, but yeah, how can we do something a little more interesting? And I want to use a different tool to show you guys, uh, I, I think, some more innovation that's happening. So there's this cool company called Edge, Edge Impulse. Um, basically, it's one of the guys who worked on uh, um, TensorFlow Lite. And he has, you know, basically created a startup with a couple other folks because they, you know, see the value in this. And he created a web-based tool that kind of walks you through the whole TensorFlow Lite for Micros process. Really nice tutorials. Uh, check that out if you're going to um, do some of these kind of more interesting models. And I'll, here, I'm going to kind of walk you through. I, I thought a cool demo here would be um, uh, like some cough detection where, you know, hey, if people are coughing, they got COVID or whatever, you can kind of realize that, hey, there's, there might be somebody who shouldn't be entering your, your business or, you know, might be trying to hide, hide their uh, um, illness or something, you know, or maybe for airport security, whatever. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Fawcett one and some other demos are, are other good examples of what might, um, you know, what you maybe could do with some audio detection on this thing. So let's pull up the edge impulse stuff. All right. So as I mentioned, they've got this really, um, really nice tutorial to um, recognize sounds from audio. Check that out. But um, <clears throat> So these guys have a really cool, um, yeah, so in, in this case, I created a cough demo. And is that readable or do I need to make that bigger? Probably bigger, huh? It's a little bigger, be good, yeah. Yep. Good, okay, perfect. So you can create, uh, um, you, you create um, a project and then it really just kind of walks you through it. It's really, really pretty cool. Um, so you connect a device. Here you can see I've got uh, one of our devices connected. I'm gonna go ahead and connect that device back up again. Um, and what you do um, with this um, is you also run a, they have a, um, a command line utility and this will also pop up and allows you to collect data because data collection on these embedded devices sometimes is like a whole nother program that you have to write um, capturing the data. And so um, they have this edge, they have, they have uh, some firmware that you load on the device and then they have this edge impulse daemon that connects to the device and um, connects up to Edge Impulse's website. So you can see now I'm green. They, they see the connection. This device is now available for some data, con data collection, which I think is it. So, um, and then we can do data acquisition. I've done a, a decent number of these in, so far. Um, I, so I spent about, yeah, in 10 second in intervals, uh, earlier today I was uh, 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 recording myself coughing. <laughs> And so that, I can only take so much of that. I probably should have more training data, um, but that's, uh, that's been uh, uh, good enough for us to kind of train a model. But anyway, so what we, when we can kind of, I can kind of walk you through the process of how this works with this tool, but they, um, you, you pick what label, you know, and this is a classification system, right? So we're, we're labeling data in two or more, you know, different uh, um, categories and then um, and so you can see they have, I have coughs and I have just background noise. This is me typing. This is me like getting up and, and down from my chair. This is me like um, banging on things, background noise, my kids screaming, whatever. And then the same, at the same time I did coughs, you know, over top some of that background noise as well as just like totally blank. Um, 
they've got a pretty nice interface here where you can actually go, you know, and see like, oh, here's the cough and listen to it. Um, here's the background noise. I did some of me talking and everything. So, and then, and then they've got, they've set it up specifically for the, uh, for this BLE sense board so that it will, um, I can go ahead and record something. So like if I wanted to add a piece to the data set and let's add some more background. Um, and the, the sample length is really um, uh, based on uh, uh, how much RAM this thing has to really store it. Because what it does is it stores all the data on chip. And then once you're done, then it uploads it all to the, to the cloud. So let's grab something from the microphone. This is going to be background. So this is going to be me talking. You know, um, it, it sends a command um, from the website down to the daemon. Now you can see sampling started. We got about seven seconds left. I'm just gonna keep on talking, blah, 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 blah. All right, so now our sampling's done. It uploads it to the cloud. And now I've got another um, piece of data in our collected data set. Um, and you can see here's me, here's me talking in my audio, which is, I think, pretty neat. Um, the, so, and they, you know, it, it, again, I think as a lot of people maybe know about, you know, these algorithms, the training data set is one of the biggest pieces of this. Um, they've got some data sets that you can play around with if you want to. Otherwise, uh, you know, like this is this is a big piece of uh, um, making AI work on these micros or anywhere really is, is large sets of data. Um, but then once we've got our data, we can design an impulse. I've already put one together. Um, they've got their, so what we do with that data, we got those 10 second clips basically of, of both uh, coughs and background. And now um, with this window size, um, we we basically say how how do we want to chop up those um, those uh, um, uh, audio samples into one millisecond um, basically chunks and or one hundred one second chunks one thousand millisecond chunks and then we step by five hundred every every time so we get a little bit of overlap we're trying to basically squeeze more you know more uh, uh, runway out of our data to to try to get as much training data as we can. Um, out of what our recordings. Um, they have a couple of um, processing blocks is what they call them. So they got this spectral analysis one, a flattened one, MFCC, which is a really good one for audio, and then just basically raw data to do that. You can even add custom blocks. I haven't actually explored that. Um, and then they've got uh, a typical neural network. Um, you can play with that. Um, uh, two, I'll show you in a sec. And then once you've created that, you save your impulse. And once you save it, then you can go into the settings here for MFCC and neural net classifier. And now we can actually see like, and honestly, I haven't really dug into all of these coefficients. Um, this is where the black art of uh, what I feel like is half art, half science of AI comes in. There's a lot of trial and error that I, I've experienced. And maybe some of you on, on at the Q&A can tell me where the, Q, where the trial and error is, uh, you know, uh, is, is not appropriate <laughs> or or if you've got the magic formula for some of that like model uh like determining your model architecture and stuff but this is where a lot of that i think just kind of comes in of just trying some stuff out um but you can see that yeah uh, we've been able to extract kind of spectral analysis of, of some of the pieces of data in this which is great and i, I love this tool because it makes it look so easy <laughs> it kind of walks you through this all but uh you can oh, specify how much oh sorry I, no thought, sorry. I was like, what's the perfect time? Someone just asked, is this running on an embedded device or is it so um, just used to establish the model to do prediction? This, this is um, a case where we're, we're getting training data from the embedded device, then creating the model in the cloud. And that's what this, is, this tool is doing. And then we are going to generate a, a quantized model that we will then push back down to the embedded device and it will run on the embedded device for inference. That answer the question, hopefully. So I'm, I don't know, I'm gonna bump it up to 400 cycles. We'll see how it does. Um, and yeah, minimum confidence 0.7 seems good. We've got a pretty eh, decent size you know, network here, but you can kind of, you can play with these settings uh, and try to figure out something that works, you know? And then you can train it on the cloud. Um, <clears throat> and then the really nice thing too, I think about um, this tool then too, is they let you do live classification if you wanted to upload something else and see how your model's doing in the cloud before you dump it onto the micro, you can do that. Um, 
how are we doing? Meh. Not super great. <laughs> Looking for this loss number to drive down to zero and it's yeah, it's struggling. I I I don't have quite enough uh training data. This is what I saw when I was uh putting it together too is but hey, we'll be able to demo demo it. It's not yeah, it's all right. <laughs> oh um but then we can uh, go grab uh, an, uh, a sample now. So here, I'll, I'll try coughing a little bit. And I maybe, I don't know if I want to mute or not, but <laughs> while I do this, here I can, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll mute, but know that I'm coughing. <laughs> All right, and then I'm just going to leave the last couple seconds as, as nothing. And then we can see it's going to split it up into, um, it's going to basically run our model as is, classify it, and then split it up into um, these pieces. And you can basically see the, um, it's, it's, it's providing a prediction. So it's timestamp zero. This is about 54% confidence background and 46% cough. So that's like a, I don't know what's happening. Then at 500, it's like, that's definitely a cough. And then here it's a, you know, just barely thinking it's background. It may have, it's, it could be that this little chunk of data had like half of a cough in it or something. But then you can see, I kind of, I was coughing pretty, pretty regularly here. Um, and then, and then here, and then towards the end of the data, you know, now it, it knows, Hey, we're back to background noise. So, and they've got like a fancy graph, like everyone sees, and you can see like, hey, it's a little messy, but yeah, it's, it's doing the business. So let's, let's go with it. Um, so we've got a model, we've uh, uh, trained it, we've uh, kind of tested it, and then they've got, you know, basically a pretty nice way to import it. You can import it as a C library, Arduino. Um, you can dump it right to this Nano 33 BLE that I've got or another place. Um, and then here's a really cool part too. So we can, so it's, it's gonna tell us like, again, these quantization uh, um, optimizations that are made on the, on the model can really make a pretty big difference. Um, so yeah, the, you know, here you can see like a, an unoptimized kind of normal tensor flow light model, uh, of this size would take 16 K and take 165 milliseconds to run, use a bunch of Ram quantized it at N8 and it's, um, you know, quite a bit faster order of magnitude faster and half the size, half the Ram. I don't, I, I'm not sure why the confusion matrix didn't show up. I think it did when I was doing it earlier, but. That would help help us decide whether um you know whether we lost too much fidelity um, with the um with the quantized version, but um, at this point I don't think we have. So let's build it. Hey, hey Joe, what's the what's yeah. their what's their pricing model here for Edge Impulse? I mean, is it free up to a certain number of devices? How how, how do they uh, charge typically? Do you know? I don't know yet. Um, I I think they're kind of somewhat in like let's just test it out and learn from our users mode right now. But it is a really cool um, uh, tool for just kind of trying this out. Um, so, so yeah, then we include a, a zip library. Let's see, I tossed in my downloads, I'm pretty sure. Let me go grab it. Oh my gosh. Where did it go? That was, that was Arduino dying again. One moment, I dragged it to the other screen. <laughs> I'm gonna pause sharing real quick, just cause I wanna make sure I'm protecting client info here. Hey, we're probably gonna shift over to Q and A here in the next couple of minutes, Joe. Yep. So Sounds good. Once, once you get done with this piece, and then we'll just yep. open it up. This is pretty much all that's left. I, why don't we just shift there now and I'll just kind of uh, uh, wrap it up so we have enough time for Parker's stuff too. Cool. All so do we know isn't my friend right now.
All right. So I imported that, um, I imported that uh, um, cough demo. Mm. And then uh, here we've got that. Um, I can pull up this uh, sense microphone example. Close this one. And then what this has in it, it's inside of this header file is our big, huge matrix of model, right? And, uh, and then we can upload this and run this on our board. I think I got the port set. Yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, anyway, I think, um, you know, as, as we're waiting for this to show off, I think, yeah, takeaway is that it's, it's pretty easy to check this out and get started with it and play around with it. Um, and you're not that far away from something that uh, uh, can do some really interesting things. Um, and, and even uh, then uh, converting that to a more standardized model, uh, or like pulling that into your own uh, firmware that is running in a more traditional um, uh, setting rather than Arduino. And uh, it could be, you know, um, shipped to production. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty awesome how, how close you are. This, this dev board you have, you said has a bunch of different sensors on it. I mean, one of mm -hmm. them is a, a microphone, right? Yep. Um, and then it, it's connected via Wi-Fi or something like that as well. It just the thing that popped in my head was like, could you make your own Alexa essentially, right? <laughs> have it just listen for, for keywords. Yep. Yeah, no, you totally can. In fact, that's one of the, one of the demos is yes, no um, classifier. It's okay. basically, and it's, it's, it's trying to decide if, if it's yes, if it's no, or if it's background noise. And so um, you can just do wake word versus background noise. And, I, and you could get going with that type of thing really easily with the edge impulse um, stuff too, where you can train it really quick. And um, yeah, not, I'm not associated with this guys, these guys, I just think they're got a really cool tool. That's easy, easy for demos and show off what's going on. Um, the, uh, yeah, yeah, you could, and it, it doesn't have Wi-Fi, but it has BLE. So that's the way you can, um, yeah, that's just because I didn't have the port set before I hit go. Now I've got it set. So now we should be able to load it and then can try a few coughs. <laughs> Uh, well, or not. It's a bummer of an ending. <laughs> oh, I wonder if I need to. Sometimes you have to pop this thing in DFU mode by hitting the button a couple times. Oh, come on. Now you see what the life of a software engineer is every day, right? So do you mind if I open it up? Um, totally. We have, Go for it. I'd say we have about like 10, maybe 15 minutes for questions. And I, I'm not sure how many people um, will have okay. them or if I'm missing something in the chat. Um, I'll sure, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then we can have any talk and then we'll move um, to Parker as well. And to start with everyone while I, um, I'm trying to figure out how to be able to unmute everyone so that anyone <laughs> can kind of jump in. <laughs> That's my daughter. <laughs> awesome. Um, I can't figure out how to mute everyone, so I can ask you to unmute if you want to chat and I missed you. We just have a couple of minutes, um, but a reminder, we're going to post this video and then Joe, obviously I'm assuming you're available for questions and follow up and things like that. Yeah, yep, for sure. 
Am I missing? I appear to have the power to unmute, at least speak one person at a time. <laughs> I, have the, I have the power to mute all. Here, we, I can, we can allow anyone to unmute themselves. I think right now, if anybody wants to be able to try, try that. If anybody's got a question. Yeah. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I'm happy to take, you know, if you, if you got something on the tip of your tongue and you want to ask it later, that's fine too. Why don't we, um, why don't we move on and then I'll keep looking at the chat and we can make sure that we get anything addressed. Otherwise, like I said to everyone, Joe, I know you'll be available for specific questions too. So yep, Dan perfect. will not allow himself to unmute. So I think that's part of the problem. Just, there we go. Oh, there Dan. we go. Did that work? Yeah. Um, Dan McCreary, did you have a question? I saw you just unmuted. Okay, it's I, been a couple. I don't know, I just think it's an awesome technology. And uh, I just wondering, do you have uh, use cases that you're working on right now or uh, you're interested? In? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one um, really interesting one that we're working on right now is we have a, um, a robotic application that uh, um, we, we need to be able to sense not only that it ran into something, but kind of like the, the texture of what it ran into. Um, and so based on the current draw from the motor and the way that it hits um, the, um, the obstacle, we've been able to uh, classify the device in a way that works for that particular application. Um, so that's been a really interesting thing. I think like, like Justin said too, uh, there are a lot of folks um, looking into that predictive maintenance based on vibration or other kinds of um, uh, like temperature, other information that you can get from a device. Um, you know, so sometimes it's straightforward and you can just use an algorithm and I would highly recommend doing that instead of using deep learning if you, uh, if you can, but if it is a little more hairy and, uh, you know, difficult to, uh, to, to do it with a, a straight up algorithm, then, uh, this technology is, uh, is kind of like, um, yeah, is, is kind of the only way to, to get there right now. And it's becoming available on these small, small devices, which is cool. Cool. All right, Joe. Well, I appreciate right. it. This is Ross is awesome. Well hey, done. Welcome. Thanks. And we'll, yeah, we'll be sure to put your contact information and stuff like that um, when we post the follow up. So Parker, are you uh, ready to go? Yep. Cool. Um, let me see here. I'll get this going. All right. So, uh, as sort of Justin mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to be talking about uh, using machine learning to predict uh, what pitch is going to be thrown in a baseball game next by a pitcher. Um, so, what about me? I'm st currently a student at the U of M uh, studying computer science. I mentor at Coder Dojo uh, and involved with the AI Racing League, uh, intern at Optum, and most importantly for at least this talk is uh, I'm a baseball fan. So uh, this winter, the Major League Baseball world was sort of rocked by this revelation that the Houston Astros stole uh, the opposing team's pitch signals from a center field camera um, and communicated what pitch was going to be thrown next um, via banging on a trash can uh, in their dugout. So, you know, if the catcher was signaling to the pitcher, hey, throw a fastball, there would be a loud bang coming from their dugout. Uh, you know, something that a batter could pick up on, but it'd be sort of hard to, to pick out of the background noise of the stadium um, from anything farther away. Um, and their system ended up being about 93% accurate. Somebody actually went through and watched all the Astros games from 2017 season and listened for them banging in the audio feeds. So I was like, well, could, you know, machine learning do better? I can already, you know, say, oh, this, 
you know, as a layperson baseball fan, I can go, they, they threw a fastball, you know, up and in, maybe they'll go with a change up down and away the next pitch just to throw the batter off some. So I was like, I bet machine learning could, you know, do better at pattern recognition than I could. Um, and you, you may think that some of the, you know, analytics already are in place in baseball. And I, I was lucky enough to talk to a data science guy at the Twins. Um, and it turns out that in-game analytics is really not what they're focusing on. It's much more of how do I get the best, organize the best team um, with the least amount of money. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of popularized by uh, Moneyball, both the book and the movie with Brad Pitt. Um, and they use statistics such as WAR, um, which is wins of, above replacement. Um, and these models need to be explainable uh, both to the players and agents. Um, but I was like, oh, well, let's look at, you know, something in game and see what we can do there. So as far as data goes, there's this really nice a uh, Python package called PyBaseball, um, and it allows you to access the MLB StatCast data. So StatCast has every single play in Major League Baseball recorded since I think 2011 or something like that, and it has the pitch type, the you know current state of the game if there's runners on base, uh, the inning, as well as the uh, speed of the pitch also tracks like the ball's movement through uh, the release of the pitcher's hand to the plate. So it has like a spin rate and uh, vertical drop, things like that. Really cool system um, and a ton of data that can be explored with it. But I wanted to, you know, have something that was uh, in between pitches. Hey, let's communicate to the pit batter, you know, what might be coming next. So I narrowed down the data fields uh, to what you can see on the screen there. Um, so, you know, if there's a runner on base, where they are, how many outs there are, uh, the balls, the strikes, uh, what stance the pitch or the batter is in, if they're a lefty or a righty, same thing with a pitcher and what the uh, previous uh, result of the pitch was. So we looked, I looked at uh, Jose Barrios's pitches from the 2017 through the 2019 season. Um, and so we can sort of see the breakdown of his pitches here. Uh, about 26, 2700 of them were four seam fastballs, uh, followed up by the curveball. Uh, two seam fastball and a changeup, and you can see that it's uh, really sort of an, an imbalanced data set. So there's this tool called SMOT uh, that basically uh, creates synthetic data um, to make sure that all the classes are evenly distributed. Um, so it looks at the different uh, data points that resulted in a change up being thrown and sort of plays around with those and gets the um, gets a close approximation of a synthetic data point that you know this might be where they throw a change up um, so then all the classes are balanced and so the Astros didn't actually communicate what exact pitch is coming, um, but that only if it's a fastball or uh, off-speed pitch. So I classified a two-seam fastball and a four-seam fastball uh, into the fastball category, and then an off-speed pitches are change-ups, uh, sliders, curveballs, things like that. So we also uh, used smote here as well to even out the things. 
And I tried a whole bunch of different models, uh, decision trees, um, K nearest neighbors, an SBM. And it turned out that a neural network uh, works the best. Um, so I, as you can see, it's not very uh, deep. It's only two hidden layers. Um, but I was able to achieve 74% uh, accuracy on the multi-pitch classifier and a 58% accuracy on just the fastball off-speed classifier. Um, so definitely not uh, up to the Astros level of, uh, you know, accuracy, but still not the worst. And there's a couple of different ways that this could be extended and improved. Um, so yeah, cheating is the best way to go, it turns out. Um, but using a different neural network architecture, such as an LSTM to model the pitch by pitch sequence. So not only the previous pitch, but you know, if I'm predicting the third, fourth, fifth pitch at the bat, you know, having the history of the entire at bat could end up uh, helping, but I haven't explored that yet. Um, and then there's also uh, tons of other avenues for uh, machine learning in baseball. Um, one of the things that I would, uh, like to do is using reinforcement learning to figure out uh, lineup or pitcher management uh, by running these simulations um, and getting um, determining if you know maybe having a starting pitcher go six innings is not the way to you know effectively manage your pitcher roster. Maybe it's actually better to reduce each individual's load to maybe an inning. Um, so you have nine pitchers, but those nine pitchers go out and pitch an inning like every day um, compared to a starter going six innings and pitching every fifth day uh, like they traditionally do. Um, as well as, you know, player performance prediction, um, which is sort of going back to what is already done analytics wise but that's about it uh any questions uh you can also contact me and connect on linkedin with me uh at those links uh i'll send the deck to the powers at b great awesome great thanks thanks parker um Actually, I'm gonna un I can un unmute this. Um, I think there was a question with regards to. I mean, do you, do you have this code open sourced? Is it is it yeah. available and stuff? Where, where you keep your code, Parker? Yes, uh, it is on my GitHub, um, and I'll throw that link in the uh, in the deck as well to get it out to everybody. Cool. There's a question from Paul. Um, have you thought about batter by name against pitcher by name as previous success by pitcher against a batter would influence his pitch selection, right? So if they've seen the person before, um, would that have any, that could potentially have any, that could, that could potentially have an impact on when they show up against each other and if they throw a fastball or not, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think that would also be a good avenue to explore. I, when we started out on this, I thought about breaking it out by batter. Uh, but then I realized, like, there aren't that many data points. Um, I mean, we're going to have, uh, we're, we're going to have, you know, maybe say a good, division opponent you're going to have something like 20 30 games with them throughout the season and if we're talking starting pitchers then it's like maybe six games um against this opposing team and so then you're 
you know, down to three at bats. So we're looking at uh, 18 at bats over the course of a season times five pitches or so. So we're only looking at like a data set of about 100 um, if we broke it down by batters, which, um, you know, maybe uh, some transfer learning or something where you train a more general model and then specify on a batter, um, it might be better. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Good. There was another question from, from Ryan and he, he feel free to unmute yourself. If I don't get this right, he just, he had asked, what's the more, uh, why is it that the more specific classification was more accurate than the more general? Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure of that myself. Hmm. Um, my hunch is is that the um, fastball, no fastball data, I mean, when you're testing it, these are not, um, the, they're not balanced uh, test sets. So my guess is that there's probably some overfitting or something along the lines of that it was not, uh it just it wasn't turning out great um yeah i'm not sure <laughs> parker do you want to talk a little bit about your uh tool set of choice uh are you using jupyter notebooks uh any special debugging techniques uh, uh how did you learn all this stuff yeah, so um, I am sort of in the, I'm gung-ho on uh, VS Code right now, and they have notebooks, uh, Python notebooks support within the editor. So yes, it's a quote-unquote Jupyter notebook, um, but uh, it, it's in VS Code. Um, and as far as learning the stuff, um, I mean, a lot of uh, online videos, uh, you know, great mentors uh, such as yourself and others that are on this call. Um, and, uh, you know, just reading up on things. Um, but, yeah. Uh, have you taken any classes in data science at the U yet? So I just took my uh, a data science class at the U. Um, it was data science two INET forty seven ten, um, and it was mainly dealing with Spark um, and PySpark. And our final project was um, presenting or uh, predicting a home price, uh, home value uh, with scrapes Zillow data, also got uh, data from the Department of Revenue as far as uh, home sales. Um, and uh, so we came within about $1,000 of Zillow's predictions, uh, which we thought was pretty cool. Um, turns out Zillow's not that accurate either. Um, their, their average error is about 45 grand or so. Um, so we're like driving, trying to drive this air number down because we thought 50, you know, 46, 50 grand was bad. And then we were like, oh, the experts can't really do much better. So cool. <laughs> um, do you think that you got, you're getting a good education in data science at the U? Um, I mean, I think the U is moving on its way to getting up to speed with the the data science programs. Um, I know that just in the past year or so, there's been an introduction of a data science master's. I think there's an undergrad degree uh, program showing up 
it's either new for this year or next year, somewhere along those lines. Um, so, I mean, as far as I, I think there are uh, some things that they need to catch up on, but I think they they realize that. So, you know. That's good to know. Um, let's see. How big was this uh, data set that you pulled in? Uh, so the two years of Jose Barrios's pitches was, I think, 8,000 pitches, 8,700 mm -hmm. pitches, something like that. Let's see. Uh, 8,600, uh, rows. Huh. Well, the indexing is off. That's weird. And it's probably NANs dropping, but anyways, sure. so, um, yeah, yeah. 8,600, uh, rows. So I also did one on the entire, uh, I grabbed like an entire season's worth of pitches um, of the whole league. Um, and that, that accuracy was not uh, great. Uh, I think it was mostly because uh, with various different pitchers in that data set, each of them have the different ways to, um, you know, go about their at bats um, and how to manage the at bat. Um, so their patterns might be different, and that's why I think the league uh, wide one didn't fare really as well. Sure. Yeah, I, I just I would have no concept of how many pitches are actually thrown in, in an entire year. So it's just kind of there's lots of fun stuff I'm sure you can do once you have that amount of data over an entire season or more. Yeah, and yeah. like you could pull seven, eight seasons worth. I mean, it's a lot to download, but nothing's stopping you. And the Pi Baseball package is wonderful. It's mm -hmm. like, give us the dates that you want. If you want a specific team, that's great. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pull it and give you a pandas data frame and here. Um, so it's a really nice tool to use. Excellent. Cool. Any other questions people want to jump in and ask Parker here before we sort of wrap up? Hey, I have a quick announcement. I had to join a little late here, but, uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that, uh, a lot of us uh, have been involved in this thing called the AI Racing League, and uh, we are going to be trying to move it onto an online medium uh, where uh, people will build models on their local systems and race in a virtual universe using uh, uh, the game engine. So if anybody is interested in uh, uh, doing online uh, donkey car races, uh, let me know. Fabulous. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I guess any, any other announcements that people want to make? I was going to share real quick. That's how there's, there's nothing else for people. I, I was just going to share. I think I, I mentioned it at the beginning. So uh, our first meetup, we sort of talked about applied AI as being sort of one of the many um, groups that we'd like to uh, grow out of the Emerging Technologies North um, nonprofit. So we launched our website, mtechnorth.org. And uh, you can go there, um, talks a little bit about our story. You can, you can register to get on our, our mailing list. Um, the applied AI group is this group. So point people here and they can link off and start checking out our meetups or follow uh, Applied AI, AI on Twitter. Of course, if you go to AppliedAI.mn, you'll go to the meetup group, you know, as well. But the thinking here is, is yeah, as we start, if you run an emerging technologies group or you want to start a group around emerging tech, please talk to me. I think we, we want to continue to sort of grow this website out with all sorts of different uh, um, facets of emerging technologies. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we also have a conversations on applied AI podcast. So 
uh, Dan, you were the first one. Thank you for being the guinea pig. Uh, and so Dan and I had a really good, good uh, conversation here for episode one. And uh, um, I just published episode two, which was um, on healthcare. Um, and it was uh, Sentil that spoke on, on AI and healthcare uh, last month. Um, Parker's going to be on the show coming up and so is Joe and I've got about a couple other people uh, as well that I'm going to be talking to. And, uh, and I will say also, please reach out to me. If, um, uh, John Herkey, I saw you on there too. John, J John uh, was, was interviewed recently as well. So yeah, I, I appreciate it and it's going to be really, really fun. We've had a lot, a lot of great conversations here. Um, and so, so yeah, and we will be posting tonight's thing um, on our YouTube channel as well. Jen will be handling that. So now all of our previous sessions and stuff like that will show up on our, on our YouTube channel, um, which is sort of, I guess, the, some of the silver linings of, of, these, of, these, of everything going virtual. We had a really difficult time recording presentations and videotaping them and getting, getting everything together. And now that it's on Zoom, we can uh, more easily share this with the wider audience if you're not able to make it to these, to these things. So that's about all that I really had for right now. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, and hope to see you back next month, I guess, right? We'll be meeting on J July 2nd, um, and, uh, and just stay tuned for all the stuff in the future. Take care. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Thanks a lot, Justin. Thanks, Jen. Uh, th thanks, thanks, Parker. Parker. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.